I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. All right, everybody, welcome here. You just heard Jeff Foxworthy give us a nice introduction. And a little bit later on in the show, we're going to have uh, the Jeff's manager, Larry Burns. Larry Burns. Who's one of my favorite people. Yeah, he's I, a great guy. I just enjoy Larry Burns. But we'll have him on. He's got... He got a dog last year from the Gamekeeper Kennels, and he is so proud of that dog. Oh, Bogey, isn't that his name? Bogey is That's his name. That's a great dog it name. I think he likes him. Well, it was so much fun when uh, – He Larry, brought him over for training or he something. He did and left him and then called every other day checking on the dog. And it, You had to go down there and, and check on him, didn't you? I had to send videos and take bananas to the dog. Bananas. Bogey loves some bananas. He's got a high potassium level, I imagine. You know, <laughs> but look here. So that's Lanny Wallace talking. I'm Bobby Cole, and to my left is Dudley Phelps. We refer to you as the tree nerd. That's me. And then sitting on the other side, if we'll wake up, there's uh, Jason Cleveland. Hello. He's over here as our producer Cleve. extraordinaire. So we're doing the podcast today from the heart and soul of the Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio. I am studios. so glad we have a name, new name, a new adjective for the, the studio here. Well, people ask what bowels meant, and I just said it meant we're way up in the building. <laughs> <laughs> True. Hey, that's, that's a lot better. So, uh, look, I don't know about you guys. I think I know, but dove season is a few days away. That's it, some exciting news. This weekend, what's the day? Uh, September 3rd. Starts Saturday. Saturday. In Georgia, it starts the Saturday as well. I think Alabama starts tomorrow, too. Mm, I assume I mean, so. uh, Saturday. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. <laughs> we look <You> at would... <laughs> Dudley. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know they opened in California because I saw our buddy, Jeremiah Dotty, uh, with a made a, a, a Dove pizza. I saw Ooh. that on Instagram. Man, it looked tell, delicious. They dug, it and there's delicious. a Dove recipe in our... Next issue of Gamekeepers. All I don't right. know if I'm going to spoil that or not. Oh, but, yeah, Stacy. Uh, that that looked delicious. Oh, my well. goodness. Dove's one of my favorite things to eat. It is my favorite thing flying around. I'm not going to lie about it. It's good. How do you like them? How do you like them? Best? Grilled. Dove. Grilled. Jalapenos stuffed in them. Jalapeno on a dove stick. Yes. Do you, do you leave them on the bone? I like them both ways, but uh, uh, I've gotten in my latter years, I've started kind of filleting them off the bone because oh. my wife likes them better. Oh, no, because your dentures. I don't have dentures. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lord have mercy. Hey, uh, and I'll, you know, uh, did you listen to the, the Jerry Clower I Dove did. episode? I did. them to death. Man, he is so funny. Y'all look that up on YouTube. Yeah. Something Jerry Clower Dove hunting. Yeah. It's, it's worth your time. Oh, he talks about cooking and putting a big old slab of butter in the chest cavity. <laughs> and wrapping yeah, a did. piece of bacon around him. Yeah. And he caught them turtle doves, if I'm not mistaken. There's <laughs> some story about a man scaring, scaring him to death by smiling at him. He's got some good stories. I grew up listening to Jerry Clark stories. And I can, a lot of them, I can quote them verbatim. Yeah. And just absolutely. What's your favorite one? Uh, you know, the one I remember so much is it, when I'm on a scooter and some suspenders. And you get, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here it comes. Yeah. There it goes. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And then something about somebody with a chainsaw and a screen door. Yeah. <laughs> they gave Marcel the beard. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, my favorite ones always involve the coon hounds, or old brummy and old dummy. And yeah. Oh, I know one about a uh, uh, one. He got a bobcat up in a tree, or oh yeah, shoot up in here amongst. Oh, so somebody <laughs> got to have some relief. <laughs> oh yeah. man, we didn't need to go listen to all those. Those are so good. You know, Toxie actually had the privilege of going hunting sure with did. Jerry Clower. That's a good story. Yeah. Possibly for a future podcast. Yeah, let's get Toxie and ask him that story. I think that turkey's still here somewhere, isn't it? You know, I don't know. I don't know. But I know he killed a turkey with Jerry Clower. And how many people can say that? I don't know. They called up a turkey for Jerry Clower. And I don't ruin the story. Yeah, Bob. Uh, okay. All nah. Right. All right, all right. We're going to have a Jerry Clower episode. Yeah. We can talk about him and old Leonard's losers. 
<laughs> that was good. Get me out of here, Percy, was a great line. Yeah. I was impressed with that. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be our age to know who Leonard's loser. Mm-hmm. It's just one of those things, you know, I, when I think about dove season, I think about riding – and uh, my dad's 73 Bronco, it being hot, the windows rolled down, and you'd listen to Willie Nelson and listen to Jerry Clower and listen to Leonard's Losers. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was a good time. Am right I there. dating myself? Maybe. Yeah. But those were good. Those were just such good times. Good wow. stuff. Wow. All right. So, what were we talking about? We were talking about a favorite way to eat doves. What about you, Dudley? Are you a grill guy? Um, my My favorite by far is to do the old braised Mm, dove mm. so you kind of fry them for a minute and and then you put them in a roux with some sherry or wine or broth and cook them in that for hours on the bone yeah and then have a little rice and rice rice. oh yeah grits Grits. never done it with grits my mom used to pan fry them and then braise them and then serve them exactly rice and gravy that's my favorite Oh, it was good. <laughs> Doves, rabbits, any anything is good like that. Yeah, old braising. I like them any way I can get them. They are so oh, good. Oh, man. And that's the truth. Well, okay. Before we go any further, why don't we just go ahead and get Larry on the phone and get him knocked out? Yeah, sounds good. All right. Man. So, producer See what Cleveland. he's got lined up for this weekend. Yeah, you know what? So, guys, what I wanted to talk to him about was. I know he's excited about taking both, yeah. but just what he's done to get his dog ready and in shape mm-hmm. for the opening day tomorrow. I can hear like I the tiger playing and him and Bogey running down the streets <laughs> in Georgia. Mm. <laughs> you know, and Georgia's a puppy state over there. They, Larry's a he's a bulldog. So. <laughs> The Gamekeeper magazine is our life outdoors on paper. We love Gamekeeper's magazine. It's full of great information. Full of ideas on how to make the habitat better. From plots to trees to whitetails and waterfowl. It's total farm management. There's so much information in Gamekeeper, especially when it comes to managing your property. You can't go wrong if you want to improve your habitat for wildlife. Pick up our Gamekeeper's magazine. Gamekeeper, the journal of wildlife stewardship. Hello, Mr. Larry Burns. Bobby Cole. All right. Well, look, we are proud to have you. Larry is a a special guest here for our podcast. Larry, we've known Larry for a while, and uh, he's a he's a great gamekeeper. He's got a farm over in Georgia. We won't give the zip code. But he's managing and trying to grow some big deer. And, and Lanny, he's actually, I bet he's one of the only people in the state of Georgia that's got a duck pond and is growing rice over there. And and But he did all this. He got a puppy last year. I'm, Larry, I'm eventually going to let you talk. No, for a second. no. <laughs> but he got no, a pu- I like it better when you talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got a puppy. And the, the little black lab named Bogey, they fell in love. Larry is so in love with this dog. I can and, understand. And then brought the dog back for training and the, the whole nine yards. Well, so he built this duck pond. In a, the a, red hills of Georgia. Of Georgia. <laughs> well, there is not a duck within, there, uh, maybe some wood duck. But he built a duck impoundment just for this dog. That is and awesome. he may tell you something else, but that's the, that's what he did. And his son's got a, a, a a, a dog that so they're really really into duck hunting but he's got this new puppy and i larry what we wanted to hear today is what all you have done to get bogey ready for prime the, time the, the big opening day and is, just we wanted it, to check in with you so it opens saturday there well it does open saturday and i've, I've got him i got him bathed i got his nails done <laughs> all right i've got a new call i think i've done everything i need to do to have a successful hunt it sounds like it. We were talking earlier. We can just see you and Bogey jogging down the streets of Georgia with I the Tiger playing in the background and him getting ready. Well, I tell you what, I you know it, it is funny, and my I think my wife thought I was crazy because after raising three kids and having dogs and cats and everything else they brought home, my my midlife crisis was I got into horses. So I'd gotten two or three horses, and I made a rule, no pets under 1,500 pounds <laughs> to, keep, 
to keep dogs out of the house. And I came home after we started with this duck pond stuff. And I said, Karen, I, said, I think I want to get a puppy. And she really, all the kids and her are just, they're just cracking up because of I've, how much I baby this dog. And uh, it, it's the old story of I don't know that I picked Bogey, but he picked me because he kind of came up to me. And other than playing golf, that dog goes everywhere I go and there's never more than a step behind me. Well, they're fun, I tell you that's, that. We, that. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. That's what we say, uh, Hunter's best friend for life, because they are. We were talking about well, it last week, how it makes you want to hunt more and want to spend more time outside. So uh, I think it's a very common condition well, condition there, Larry. Yeah, you know, when I started talking to Bobby about it and just kind of feeling him out on it, and he said, well, what are you looking for? And I said, my number one priority in getting a dog is that it's got a temperament that it's good with my grandkids. And then the second one is that he's just a good companion. And last on the list, if he hunts, that's great. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I, watching this dog with my three-year-old granddaughter, is it, it's her best friend. Uh, they just, you know, he, he takes everything she dishes out, and you don't worry about him. Mm. And, uh, and on the hunting side, you know, when I brought him back over and, and had him with Mr. Bill, and I don't think the weather worked out great for a whole lot of it, but I went back over there and I spent, I think it was, I think I stayed three days. And, um, you know, to watch what he did and just talk to him. And um, I think he kind of snookered me a little bit because I ended up cleaning out kennels for three days. So I feel like <laughs> it's just like three days. <laughs> <laughs> he's good about that but, that's for sure and then when i got home every day we do something you know and, and what i've really been trying to do as much as anything is just the discipline and the control and uh and you know it's so hot that we we do a little bit of retrieving every day but not a whole lot mm-hmm. um he likes he likes staying in the lake and in the pool and um you know, when Bobby said I built the duck pond for him, we've got, obviously, over here a lot of plantation pines. And with a brush cutter on my skid steer, I have kept about 10 acres of pine looking like a state park because I'm scared of snakes for my dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you talk about that, uh, how good they are inside and how good they are outside. I think that's one of the main things about those british labs you know i'm fortunate enough to have one mine's seven years old now and you know when you were talking about uh the relationship you know bogey has with your your grandchildren it you know mine sleeps with my kids every night you know and has done that the whole time my six-year-old's been alive uh and they can constantly abuse him and he doesn't phase him at all but when we get ready to go to the field he throws on the switch uh, uh mr bill calls it bitability Bitability. Bitability. Mm. But, man, well, they're yeah, awesome companions. I'm, I'm, really, I, I'm really, really looking forward to this weekend because he loves it. I mean, you know, when we work, uh, whatever we do, and, and like, you know, when he, when he pulls out, when I tell him to go, he sends up a like a rooster tail. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so I, I'm encouraged, but I'm also realistic that um, he still doesn't really know what he's doing, and I sure don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I just try to remain just patient and not have too high of expectations. Um, but I'm excited because he's – it's funny, the different things that I've been doing with him. It's like I, I don't know how he knows to do what he does because oh, uh, yeah. it's not me. It's a lot and of instinct just, going on. Just, now they're huntable. So – I can't remember. Is he 11 months old now? No, no, no. He's about a year and a half now. Is he? Okay. Yeah, he'll be making that transition. And, and, you know, that was what was funny, is it's like just past a year, he changed. You know, it was, Mm -hmm. he just got, it's kind of like before he was listening, but he knew he wasn't going to do whatever it was I wanted him to do. (laughs) And then right at about a year... (laughs) 
he kind of started listening, and I guess he kind of, you know, figured, all right, he isn't going to go away, so I'll, I'll start doing what he wants me to do. But he's just real well behaved. And just a, That's good. Uh, he's, he's still... He'll still get jacked up on you, and he loves in the mornings. It's Katie bar the door when he's running around. Mm-hmm. So well, you, I think you'll probably be in that stage where they're starting to connect all the training and all the stuff you've been teaching him, and then connects it to the bird. And he's like, "Oh, that's why he's been telling me what to do for a year and a half." Mm-hmm. That first crippled well, bird, you know, yeah. and and then after that, it's and you know, to Bobby this. asked me about Bobby asked me if I had any feathers in his mouth, and you know, I froze some. I froze some ducks and uh, working with those a little bit. And he does fine with them, but this weekend will be interesting. And mm-hmm. Lanny, this is, I won't go on too long about this, but after I got bogey, we had somebody dump about a five year old beagle mix on our farm. <laughs> and I tried three times to give him away, and he keeps coming back like a bad tinny. And the two of them together, it is, it's, it's like, it's almost like a Disney movie. With these <laughs> well, this, Otis. this beagle. Otis, yeah. Yeah, Otis. Otis the beagle. He will get out in the lake and will he'll retrieve eventually. But he'll get, if he happens to get it, he'll do 19 different laps around the farm and then he'll finally bring it back to me. But he thinks he's one of the, one of the guys. Yeah, sounds like, it sounds like he is one of the guys. He, so he, oh, he is one of the guys, but I might have to put him in a duck line just to <laughs> tick everybody off. Yeah, you're a retrieving beagle. So when are you going to get your third dog now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, that that probably isn't going to happen. So, Larry, you know Saturday you're going to have a lot of pressure on you to be able to hit some doves. Yeah, it it, it, it brings up the ante a little bit, that's for sure. And, funny, you should say that. I've already figured out a, a, a deal with that. So I can concentrate on bogey. I'm going to sit with the best shooter for a little while. Oh, wow. That's a good call there. And then once they get on, yeah. So then I'll uh, I'll get, see how he does with that because I think it's going to be a little bit too much for me trying to keep them in tow and me worry about Shooting my one out of twelve shells. <laughs> <laughs> when when we were getting ready for this show, uh, Lanny said, "Now, isn't Larry? Didn't he and Jeff shoot doves at the Atlanta airport?" Yeah, I was going to ask you. You're going to take him to the airport? I tell you what, I wish we could. They, uh, <laughs> they screwed up and put a parking lot in our dove field. But that was that place. It was about a little two acre wood head. And doves, you just, it was just crazy. It had three cubbies of quail and all the rabbits you wanted to kick up and shoot. That's a fine, that's a fine zip code yeah, right it there. Was. <laughs> it sure was. It was. You know, the, the only problem is you did have to get dropped off to shoot it. <laughs> uh, and you had to be, you had to be on your toes. But we did have an Atlanta cop that showed up and he goes, what are y'all doing out here? And, you know, finally we just said, because I take it, I would take a push mower over there and cut the weeds <laughs> to knock some of the seeds off for the birds. And he he just kind of started laughing, and he stood there and shot with us for about 15 minutes. Oh, How about wow. that? Uh, that's some original gamekeeper stuff right there. Yeah, you went out is. there with a lawnmower at the Atlanta airport to create a dove field. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, that's wanting it pretty bad. That's awesome. Well, Larry, what's going on with Jeff? Is there anything you want to promote with Jeff? Well, you know, we uh, we just wrapped up the finale on What's It Worth. I uh, hope everybody was watching that. If you didn't, you can go back and sure catch it on a lot of the A&E channels. Um, you know, this obviously the time that we're in right now, um, there, there are certainly no crowds gathering, so we've pushed every live performance is out at least into the first quarter and kind of just waiting to see what happens. Uh, which is a shame because we had a really, really busy spring. Uh, we were also going to film uh, a Netflix special that we've got. We're going to push that out next year as well. But um, he's staying busy at the farm and doing different things. And, you know, he uh, it's a shame he can't 
you can't duck hunt or dove hunt because he's got his, you know, the, the fused neck. Shotgun's not a great thing for him. But I did, and you'll, y'all will love this and wonder what was I thinking. I told him to get a couple of duck calls and learn how to call and come out, and he could call for us. That's what we do for right Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> and and he said, well, I can't look up. I said, that's even better. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, we refer to Jeff Foxworthy as our favorite gamekeeper. Yes, he is. And I'm, I'm sorry that our gamekeeper television show was right up against your uh, What's It Worth show on Tuesday night. So we probably hurt the ratings there. But <laughs> I would expect that the next show that comes on at 9 o'clock, the following show, that – We'll, all of our gamekeeper people probably then loaded up on some what's it worth. Well, I'm sure they did, and I was wondering what poll all of our audience was. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, them so deer what antlers. Got, what are y'all got? Yeah. What do y'all have cooking for this weekend? Do y'all open up too? We do. And then we're we're thinking about shooting birds, trying to figure out where some are, and just kind of weighing our options. But it's a fun time of year because – Dove season is kind of like it's like it kicks off hunting season for us, and it uh, it's just an exciting yeah. time of year. Well, we got. Um, it's, it's, I love it because Brent and I, my, you know, Brent and my oldest son, we love doing the dove field. And we about five years ago, we drove down to a uh, Moultrie, Georgia, and bought a, probably a nineteen forty silage cutter that looks like something off of Green Acres. But I'm going to tell you what, there isn't anything better for a dovetail. It, it is unbelievable on what it can do to corn and sunflowers. So you're just running that through the field and it's basically chopping everything up, huh? Oh, what is that? I mean, you know, it, it's to create that, you know, the silage for cows and it just takes just a single row you just go down the row and that pulls it in and blows it out a chute so that it'll, it'll blow sunflower and corn 30 yards. And there is a seed left on the head. Mm. Mm. We've got some video of that happening. We've, so we've done several Dove episodes with uh, Andy Collins, and that's the way he does it is with that silage cutter. Mm. All right. It's well, incredible. now all no, no. used silage <laughs> cutters are going to quadruple in I'm, value. I'm looking right now. <laughs> but, like, they're hard to find. Um, they, they really are. We've looked quite a bit for one. Uh, and, I, and I'm telling you, this, I'll send you a picture of it. It looks like the Texas, but. Uh, it sure does make a pretty tough feel. Yeah, and right does. now, you know, right now we've we've got the birds, but y'all know how that goes. Yeah, oh, we yeah. do. We're holding a lot of birds right now too, more than I have typically seen this time of year. So my fingers are crossed. Well, Larry, we and sure I think we've got a beautiful, we've got a beautiful ninety-five degree day. Beautiful. On Saturday. Be nice and cool out. Yeah, you can get out there at about 2 p.m. and wait for the <laughs> doves to start flying at 4.30. Yeah. Hey, that being said, everybody that does go out there, take some water for your dog. That's Be sure right. Bogey has plenty of water. And don't, doesn't he like bananas? I know I know. we had to go buy a case he of bananas does. when he were in training. He loves bananas. <laughs> he does like bananas. That could be good for cramping, so. Yeah, that's a good point about taking <laughs> yeah. care of them in the heat. Yeah, take care of them in the heat. Oh, so, yeah. Well, Larry, if you don't mind, maybe next week when we do the podcast, we might drop in with you and get an update on how Bogey did. Yeah, performed. I want to hear how Bogey did. Well, it might work out real well because it might be a real good audience to sell a black lab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Larry, we appreciate you being on. And then Thanks, Larry. And Larry is the manager of Jeff Foxworthy. Mm. And who is our favorite gamekeeper? And and Larry himself is a great. He's gamekeeper. our favorite manager. Yeah. He, he really. Is. They're so much fun. Okay, well, that, you know that's kind of rude to have me on, and you keep talking about Jeff, your favorite gamekeeper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, is that rude, Dudley? It's just business. <laughs> no, it's <rude. laughs> Oh good. Well, we're we. You know what? I'm sorry. I apologize for that. But uh, we, you guys are y'all are so much fun. Please tell Jeff hello 
and uh, and folks can follow him on Instagram. I do. It's a lot of fun. It's at the real Jeff Foxworthy. And Larry doesn't have an Instagram account, or I would give it out. But Larry kind of tries to hide in the. I in can the appreciate shadows. that. I'm I'm the background guy. <laughs> That's right. So somebody's got to be it. But look, we appreciate you being on. Y'all y'all be safe and uh, and, and have fun with Bogey. Hey, we are, I appreciate it. I you know, always love you guys. And uh, the gift y'all gave me with Bogey is, is one I'll never forget because I'm going to tell you what, he's, he's got me wrapped up. No, that's <laughs> awesome, man. That's what they're supposed to do. That's right. I'm so proud you have him. So I'll check with y'all, and y'all be safe this weekend, and uh, I appreciate you having me on. Yes, sir. Thanks so much, Larry. All right, Larry. Thanks, Thank Larry. You. Have a good day. Right. See you guys. See you. When I first bought this farm a short time ago, every single field was growing up with brush eight and 10 feet high. But it went from that to this. And even though I planted biologic with very little moisture in the ground, I was really amazed at the results. I just sat in this field with my wife as she shot her very first deer. We could not be happier. We made a memory that will last a lifetime. All because of the effectiveness of the best food plot seed on the market. Biologic is better seed, pure and simple. Log on to plantbiologic.com to learn more. Hey, I'm Toxie Hayes. And I'm Cuz Strickland. You know, here at the Mossy Oak brand, a primary thing that we all believe in is the good that we do will last long after we're all gone, which is why we challenge everyone who loves the outdoors and the critters who call it home to participate in the second annual Mossy Oak Properties National Day of Conservation. That's right, Tox. It's Saturday, September the 26th. We challenge you to do something for conservation. Plant a tree, clean a stream, Hey, introduce somebody to the outdoors. We want everybody to know that if you love the outdoors, you're the tip of the spear and you're a part of this conservation effort. Absolutely. So the most important thing is, are you in? Do you accept the challenge? I accept it. Do you accept it? I had the pleasure of getting invited on one of their dove hunts and uh well you and i rode up there together yeah, yeah i remember that we were sitting there cleaning doves glenn and i were and uh i looked down and lo and behold there is a banded dove in my hand and boom like, whoa and uh no idea whose it was right and uh so i brought it inside and we set it down and couple hours later it was gone one of the people one of the other guests decided they wanted it or yeah. deserved it. and uh it took a little while but the, the band reappeared oh it did they yeah. put enough pressure on it yeah. was that the same time that they they said that they didn't know how to what the best way to cook does were and no, then that was a hunt before that i still have corporal tunnel syndrome <laughs> <from that. laughs> that was one of the best things ever <laughs> yeah so what they did that i had gone over there deadly you may not have heard uh -huh. this but uh, shot doves with them. I was, I think I was the only one that went. Yeah, I was the first one with them. You know, I said something like, "So, how do y'all like to eat? How do y'all like to eat them? Cook them?" Yeah. But, you know, and they were like, "You eat these things?" You know, something <laughs> like that. And, how do you? How do you? Yeah. And I started Ooh. naively said, "Well, I wrap them in bacon, it, 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 slice them, put yeah. a jalapeno, cream cheese." And they were like, "Oh my gosh, we've never heard of that. Could you do some of that?" Oh, so you had to cook like four hundred doves. <laughs> clean and they didn't know how to clean them yeah, they all left him back there <laughs> <laughs> and then wrap them and, and, and the whole night and, and it was i was well into cooking them before i realized that they i got had. you yeah <laughs> oh okay well they're they're world class they are but they are some good guys and then there's a boy i tell you what you talk about having a great zip code but that part of the world where they're in there's some big deer over there. It's amazing. It is. So close to Atlanta. I mean, it's just, it's a great area. And that dirt is so red. And that, and when it's, did they come to Wisconsin when the original stock? I think that's Wisconsin? exactly where they came from. Yeah. yeah, it's so interesting, always the rut, how the rut happens over there at the end of October and first of November. And then here we are about the same latitude. We're not till January or late December or January. It, it's just baffling to me because you look around and it's that 
nasty red, red clay dirt, yeah. that just looks so poor, and then it's just so game rich mm-hmm. in that area. Well, doesn't, a, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but there's a lot of people doing good yeah, habitat good habitat work. management over there. There's a lot of big landowners right there at Harris County, that mm-hmm. area. That area. So, anyway, I'm I was, I'm always tickled to hear from them. Maybe we can get Jeff on at some some point. He's so busy, but boy, I can't wait to hear what Bogey does. I hope he, you know, <laughs> I hope he doesn't do the old tie the lead to the dove stool and shoot. <laughs> He just knocked down. Anyways, I'm sure he'll have a good story. I, you know that dog. I'm I am picturing Larry with a with a cooler full of Gatorade and just whatever that dog might possibly need. It's going to be taken care of. Yeah. Hook him up to an IV <laughs> mid hunt. Yeah, you know those fans you see on the sidelines of football games that are blowing cool <laughs> those black know, ones. Yeah, La- Larry would have one of those and a generator to power it out there. I could totally see that happening. Well, what else do we have to discuss today, guys? Well, I know, I, you know, I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, it, tis the season for putting those cameras out, and some mineral sites and some rocks, you know. Um, I've heard, you know, loosely being around here for so long, talking about, you know, the needs of deer. Certain times of year, don't they need salts and need minerals versus others? Yeah, these uh, these hot months, July, August, and September is one of the hot and dry, you know, mm-hmm. especially here. And the the I, I've got my phone. I'm sitting here watching right now. That it's lit up a couple of times with with. There's two does on a rock right now on the mm-hmm. rock. Mm-hmm. So it, this is on through September is really really good. You get really good rock utilization. Oh yeah, and the deer, it, the bucks are. It, Bachelored up. Yeah, they, they are. If you have one show up, there's liable to be two or three. Are they craving, I mean, why do they crave the salt this time of year? I've always heard, and Dudley, correct me if I'm wrong, but typically what they're eating then vegetation-wise right now has so much moisture in it that they crave those salts to help flush that on through their system. Hmm. I'm not a biologist, but I think he's right. But you slept in the holiday in no. Yeah, so it's because the amount of, is it the high-protein forage that would cause them, a more protein-rich forage would cause them to desire more salt? Yeah, I don't I mean, know. I mean, because they don't in the that. winter. Yeah, it, well, no, they don't. I think it has to do with the water content in the plants. And the water content in the winter, I don't think it's that. The, the plants, the, those cool-season plants, I don't think the water content is as high on those. I don't it know. Couldn't, it couldn't be because freezes would disrupt would destroy that. the plant. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Unless it's a cool season plant. Ooh. Dudley, why don't you investigate that? <laughs> look, we will investigate that. <laughs> Call some but, of your peeps. Look, I may not, you know, I can't say why, but I can tell you I know right it now, does. The, it's kind of that the, sun spot sign. My thing. rocks uh, that I've got out, they are just wearing them out. Toxie came through here a couple of days ago. Showing some photos where I put, where he showed where he put a rock down, and yeah. then a week later it was just gone. A cavity there. We always was. we always put them out, you know, towards the end of turkey season. Just go ahead and get it going, mm-hmm. and uh, they they start going to them pretty soon. I mean, it's it's almost like if they don't have hard horns, they're utilizing salt. Soon yeah, that's, why, that's why I was kind of asking the question because it seems like once the velvet goes, then they don't need it. So I didn't know, is that like a nutritional need of antler genesis or is it just because, you know, I don't know. I'm asking myself a lot of questions. I guess I should have answers to them. You know, wild animals just seem to be better at, uh, they're more in tune with their bodies. You mm-hmm. know, us humans, you know, I'm like, well, I want to go eat at Arby's. But I need some French my fries. My brain is not telling me I need Arby's, but a deer's brain is telling them that they need that salt mm-hmm. or, or whatever it is they're favoring. And, and that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Toxie has a saying for that, and I, I can't remember. They, they think with their stomach or, or something like that. It's really interesting. It is interesting. Humans don't have that, but I think just about any animal out there does, well, except that, for us. Along that line, what's, what fascinates me is how you can have one field that's highly fertilized and one side that's not, and the deer know which they side. They can taste the nutrition yeah, in it. They yeah, can what, tell. They prefer the more nutrient-dense food source. <laughs> it is interesting. It's just an amazing animal. They, they really are. They, I love them so much. I love them, deer. But, you know, <laughs> those rocks, they're not expensive. 
And I would just encourage people to use them because you can put a camera up on a rock that's from all summer long, and especially in July, August, and September, you can get some photos of some bucks. Here's a fun project to do. I did it one time and was blown away. Um, I was always told, uh, reading in the old forums and such, that uh, you can't beat just straight up white salt. Deer absolutely love it. That's their preferred one. So I put a block of white salt, and this was at an established lick that deer were already coming to. I put a block down, and then I put a bio rock down, which is, you know, Himalayan mm -hmm. salt. Pink salt. Um, nine times out of ten, the deer were licking the bio rock. Mm -hmm. The biologic bio rock challenge. We kind of started that last year. We really do need to document mm -hmm. it because um, they and, definitely prefer it. Even people, consumers calling in, like, the pinker the rock, the more attractive it was. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you, you, we all have the cameras anyway on our salt mm -hmm. licks, so why not? Why not try it out? Yeah, it, it take the for biologic me. bio rock challenge. <laughs> hey, the stuff works, and no, you does. know, so guys, you can go to plantbiologic.com and you can look at them and and see them. They are they're just gorgeous, beautiful rocks. But you, uh, if I'm if I put one out. That, that night, I'll have deer licking on it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, I don't see how they find it so quickly, but. They do smell like 200-something thousand times more than we do. Mm -hmm. so. Have you ever licked one? Yes, I have licked one. I know Dudley has. I have. Have you ever licked one, Bobby? That's <laughs> what we wanted to know. <laughs> but, you know. I figured you'd probably cooked on one. Some yeah, we've taken some of the blocks and stuff we've cooked on them before, yeah. you know, because that was a big thing. So there's some guys that take the, the you know, cut them flat, because they're real easy to cut. Mm-hmm. And you can cut a slab and then lay a piece of meat on it to season it, mm -hmm. flip it back and forth. They're real soft, though. You can't – you know, uh, Tess and Ron Jolly have started doing something. They've got a lot of pigs. And so they would drill a hole in a rock and then get a three-foot piece of rebar, mm -hmm. put it in the ground. Hog oh, perfect. Inches, mm -hmm. And then set that rock on top, and then the pigs can't get to it. Mm -hmm. They can't reach it. Mm -mm. We've built a couple of those around here. We need to, uh, Austin's actually running a trial with them right now. The best story I have is when we first got in the rock business, th there was a guy in North Carolina that called me and, and he said, I've bought about a dozen of these rocks. And he, <laughs> he said, they're just, they were just disappearing. And I was so, I knew, I was like, oh my gosh, my deer are loving these things and licking them. To, and so he said, I just kept going back to the store and buying another one. And I'd go back the next weekend and it'd be gone. And finally, he put a camera up, and there was a bear coming over there, and he had a photograph of that bear picking up picking that them up and, and toting them, toting them <laughs> off. So somewhere there was, you know, maybe a den with a this bear. A cache of bio rocks. <laughs> uh, and then there was that one time we had that prepper call and order a whole bunch of bio rocks, and uh, he was going to store them. To eat salt the rest of his life. Hey man, hey. and and we had to just you know we had to disclose that you know this isn't a food grade. This isn't food grade salt. But right. technically, it's it's just the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, I thought that was interesting. Pretty interesting. Barrels of bio rocks. Mm. Well, I think we've about uh, tapped it out. Tapped out the rock. So uh, Dudley, we were going to talk to you about uh, this little segment you're going to call Habit Chat. Are you prepared to talk a little bit about uh, some of that? Well, I am. Uh, I think this kind of came about. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Dudley, but, you know, and correct me, Bobby, but we were, as in biologic, were some of the pioneers of bringing, you know, certain cultivars here, including brassicas. And I, I don't know if we – I don't even fully understand them because I ask Dudley questions all the time, so I thought it might be a good, you know, topic for – you know, get Dudley's perspective on really what a brassica is and some other inf interesting facts about it. Yeah, so brassicas, as most of us know, are considered coal crops. That's that's one of the nicknames. As uh, in C O L D or C O L E? C O L E, just like Bobby Cole. Oh, uh, bo why? What? Why? Yeah. Look at Bobby, well, Bobby Logic. I <laughs> They're from the family Brassicaceae, I think that's how you pronounce it, mm -hmm. also called cruciferous crops or mm -hmm. the cabbage family. So, you know, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, all that stuff you didn't like to eat when you were a kid mm -hmm. is in that family. Um, so rape, radish, uh, a beet is not a brassica. 
Is it a tuba? But it's uh, similar. <laughs> um, and most of them are biennials. Uh, we, we just, we've always referred to them as annuals because, you know, you grow them for one season. But uh, a biennial actually has to have a winter. It has to go through a winter before it will make a flower head and make seeds. Hmm. So if you were to plant it in the spring, it's not going to, it's going to grow the rest of the summer and it's not going to flower until after that after winter. winter. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's so, interesting. That is. But uh, I so mean, is that, is it, when that flowers, is that called bolting? Is that it right? is? Yeah. We, the ours have the little yellow flowers. They're real pretty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're I've either yellow or white, and the seed pod or seed, uh, it looks like a little bean, hmm. um, and it's called a salik. So, Salik. It's a Salik. And some varieties, they even breed them for a bigger Salik. Bigger pot. There's all different kinds of people have been breeding brassicas for thousands of years. And that was the, the start of the science behind biologic, right? It, it was. These uh, the, the guys from Wrightson Nutrition mm-hmm. in New Zealand, were the, they're the world's leader in forage research. And in that part of the world and in many parts of the world, uh, for dairy production and whatnot, the brassicas are the plants that well, they use. Well, oil seed, it's you know, so canola. Canola. Mm-hmm. That's the made-up name for rape because mm-hmm. they it had a bad connotation, so they gave it a new word. Didn't want to call it rape oil. So yeah. they call it. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, yeah, I get it. So they gave <laughs> it a new name. I mean, uh, as a marketing guy, I can appreciate that. <laughs> so, yeah, we use it for oil and forage, and, uh, you know, we eat the roots. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've, since day one, I've been so impressed with brassicas. And, you know, it starts off as such a small seed. It right. looks like about the size of a number eight shot, but it can produce such a giant amount of right. forage. Isn't there a reference in the Bible to that? Yeah, yeah about a mustard seed. Mm-hmm. Faith. Yeah, I'm sure is. I'm impressed, Lanny. You do something. Hey, well, my you. kids are going to Hebron now. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well you know... Uh, I, I think I know your Sunday school teacher. I'm gonna have to give him a little George. Yeah. You do know George. George is a great guy. He really is. But we do love brassicas. I mean, mainly because they produce so much forage. Uh, you know, we like our cereal grains. We like our clovers. But it's a, <laughs> you know, if if I had one spot for deer season, it's gonna be brassicas. I mean, it, it just makes so much food. Right, and help me understand, our brassicas are forage varieties, not garden varieties. That's so right. they're bred, you know, if you were just to go to the co-op and say, hey, I want some brassica seed or some rape seed versus the the brassicas and seeds that we have, there is a, a major difference. Let right. Me, let, me, let me jump in here just real quick and answer this, and then you can go. Okay. Well, on your, sure. what you've got there. But when we started Biologic 25 years ago, I think that's right. It's about 25, yeah, 25 years, years ago. ago. But I can remember traveling around. and the, So we kind of got this, this whole Brasco thing started. Right. Well, then a lot of the farm stores were reacting to that because we would sell out. We didn't have enough. Or, and then everybody's always trying to knock you off. Mm-hmm. But so they were selling garden variety rapeseed mm-hmm. to people and saying, oh, this is the same stuff same as in, bi- yeah. in, in biologic. And guys would try that and have not have the success that, the, that we were having. Mm-hmm. And the difference is when we looked it up, I can remember Grant and doing all this research, there's like 1,200 varieties of brassicas. But there's about... Less than a hundred for at that time forage varieties mm-hmm. that had been developed, and that they and this rights and nutrition had developed almost all of those. So these plants were designed to be browsed; they weren't designed to be consumed by humans. They were designed for wild to for, create as much tonnage as possible. That's right for animals to consume them. For when they browse one leaf, it grows back two. Which makes sense because New Zealand's an island, and they're trying to raise you know red deer and meat. On that's it, right. Man. It's the number. To, to industry right. in the in the country of New Zealand is deer farming, mm-hmm. and that's what and so they and they've got these deer. It's a small island. Right. They're trying to grow as much food. And as they if, can. if you know if dwarf Essex rape, which is the most popular co-op brand of seed, worked good, that's all they'd be growing over there. Yeah, I don't good think, point. I mean, yeah. you can't. You just can't argue with that. Yeah. Uh, well, our garden varieties aren't they bred for maybe sugars and taste? 
where you know, know. That, well, the grip little, for human consumption. Yeah, so. little bit of that. That's a little bit over my head. Uh, I think they taste good. I've planted them in years past, and I've seen deer eat it. Uh, it just it it doesn't get quite as big. Um, doesn't I, produce it. A probably tonnage. isn't quite as good at uh, their stomach being able to utilize all of it or something. Well, it was total but, you know, they, those country. New Zealanders, I well, mean, they... Back in the day, we were, we were having people saying, well, my deer, you know, I've got some stuff that's supposed to be just like what y'all sell, and my deer won't touch it. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a big difference. There's it a big difference. has a lot to do with taste, I think. Right. Palatability. Palatability. Yeah, at, the, at the end of the day. Oh, uh, well, the original biologic story was, uh, I remember, crude protein, 38%. TDN, total digestible nutrients at 80 or 90%, yeah. and then the highest palatability. You know, right. Those are the three cornerstones of it. And if I remember correctly, too, your first three varieties, uh, it was a summer management, a fall attractant, and a premium perennial. That's correct. And we changed. Uh, and summer fall and fall were brassicas. They were. And, and we, we learned a lot during that so we really don't recommend brassicas in the spring and summer anymore. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a fall, late summer planted product. It utilizes best. What we learned is sometimes those plants, when they're planted in the spring, they develop this naturally occurring defense system. They to keep bugs off of them, they go a little bitter. Mm-hmm. So we weren't seeing the utilization that we would see in the fall and the winter. But one of the one of the main things that I understand from y'all about planting brassicas is you do want to get them in the ground probably a little earlier. Yeah, you, you need, I always refer to it as gambling a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do that at my farm. My brassica crop goes in on uh, just, just about every year right around September 1st mm-hmm. in, in central Mississippi. Right. Um, and I try to get it all in the ground uh, by the by September fifteenth, uh, if at all possible. I'm I've got my my spot ready, and I'm watching the weather forecast. Mm-hmm. You know, and that goes along with what Mark was saying. He's like the fifteenth to the twentieth of August, fifteenth mm-hmm. to twenty fifth of August there in Missouri and Iowa, and Todd is in July. Todd yeah. Amendrude in, in Minnesota. Minnesota. Some of those folks up in Minnesota and Canada and Wisconsin and whatnot, they're even putting them in the ground uh, in June hmm. and with success. So, the, uh, you know, I guess you could think that maybe you're planting it so early that it gets a little woody and doesn't taste as good, but I, I've heard reports that deer just devour it regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we consistently, when it's fertilized correctly, see eight to ten tons of forage per acre. So you think about the old school of growing ryegrass, and you might get a ton per acre. You, you can grow so much more groceries yeah. with this product than you can with any of the old cereal type grains, right. you know, like ryegrass. Mm-hmm. It, it's just if a guy wants to manage a property and really. Uh, provide good as quality nutrition this is the way to go, way to go. yeah and it, but we are also i'm um, high on clovers mm-hmm. you know having some perennials going oh, on oh they're the perfect complement to each other i, I mm-hmm. would i would think uh, there's no question about that and i think there's some people i haven't done it yet but that are overseeding maybe brassicas into their clover plots for the fall they do, you know that premium perennial product that we have that's kind of what it's mm-hmm. designed to do mm-hmm so in theory, wouldn't the ni- the uh, the clovers produce nitrogen that the brassicas could use? I would think so. Yeah, certainly. Hey, folks, it's Jeff Foxworthy. You know, when I was a kid, my dad bought back the farm that he had grown up on, and I absolutely loved that place. I knew every square inch of it. It truly was my favorite place on earth. And when you're looking to find a favorite place for you and your family, Mossy Oak Properties can help. Visit MossyOakProperties.com to begin your search today. One last thing about brassicas that I love so much. They have a very, very deep tap root. Uh, and it, you know, you, you see a big root and then once it gets to about a foot deep, it's, it's like a thread mm-hmm. and it'll go three feet deep, you know. And when that plant dies, it leaves that little hole there. Mm-hmm. So one thing that root's doing is it's going way down deep and reaching uh, nutrients that other plants can't. So maybe 
your crop from two years ago where all that nitrogen leached into the ground really deeply before plants got it, that radish or, or rape or turnip is able to get that mm-hmm. and utilize it. And when the plant dies, it leaves that nitrogen on the surface for your next crop. But it's also like working like nature's subsoiler. Uh, that, that really deep taproot leaves a hole in the ground and so uh, it dies when it rains. Water is right. able to infiltrate down into the deeper parts of the soil instead of hitting that hard pan and just running mm-hmm. off to the side. That's so. actually how we got in the radish business and the, the radishes that were used to bust up hard pan. Yep. And, and, and it's become, I mean, if uh, you have not planted radishes for deer, you're missing out. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. They're also, uh, well, so they're good for the soil. They uh, they deter uh, nematodes, which is kind of an underground pest that affects your roots and whatnot. Hmm. Uh, so not only are they good for deer, they're they're good for your ground, and they're, you know, they're good for your future crops, so... But you're you're talking about Nebraska, and we're and radishes fall into that. Yeah. But there's some of them that we plant, and we've got this product called winter bulbs, and some of them grow it's not like a softball softball sized tuber. Yep. That a sp- tuber, especially up north, that those deer will dig through the snow to get and to. Devour. It's a great source of carbon. Yeah, it's it's all it's a perfect combination. The the snow falls on top of those things and insulates them. And they last throughout the winter, and the deer are able to paw them up and eat on something when otherwise they'd be gnawing on cedar branches and mm-hmm. stuff. They're pretty tasty. I think that the winter bulbs product, I mean, this year we, we haven't been able to keep them in stock. It, folks have figured that one out. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. A, mm-hmm. It's got to be one of our highest selling skews mm-hmm. for sure. It is. That and Final Forage, our, our new one. Uh, Which I is did. a blend of. Brassicas. Yeah, yeah. I know we've talked it's, about that last, 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 a lot this year, but it's a good one. It's important to understand that too. So the variety of brassicas. I know we got to move on, but like maximum is not one brassica. It's a no, blend. It's, it's a blend of about eight different brassicas, eight, which mature that, at different times and do right. different things. You know, I know. Uh, you know, I love. I love turnip greens and mustard greens. Mm-hmm. And I, I know when I am in a field of maximum, there's one specific one that I like better than the other ones. Is that the Biorora? <laughs> I don't know which one it yeah. is. Okay. It's a more of a turnip looking and instead of a mustard looking. I've seen you out picking in the food plot before. Yeah, it's not bad. Remember Miss Yolanda? She used to love mm-hmm. that important. She used to love to get some. Biologic challenge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Well, it, well, cool. Look, to wrap it up, though, it's a great product and – I'm I'm just proud as I can be of of uh, the success that I hear folks having with it. I mean, Dudley had a guy call the other day. I was almost in tears talking about how well his food plots. Oh had. yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah. He was a he was a retired highway patrolman, super nice guy. But yeah, uh, that makes yeah, he got good. a little sentimental about it, just about how successful it was with his grandkids and whatnot. That's what it's well, I'll tell you about. what, it is very rewarding to see something grow. You know. To put, you know, sweat and tears and time into it and, and see it. And it makes, obviously, the whole, you know, process of hunting more rewarding, as we all know. So, yeah. let's go shoot some doves this weekend, yes. wrap them in bacon. It sure seems odd to be talking about going to shooting doves, and we hadn't mentioned, like, who's Auburn playing this weekend? Who's Mississippi State playing? Yeah. It's, it's like nobody's talking about football. I, is it going to happen? I don't know. I think it's going to happen, but there's going to be an asterisk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the season kicked off. I actually turned on the TV for once and saw some team play. Of course, you know, I'm such the sports enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are. I hadn't even missed a beat. <laughs> is it basketball season? What is it? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they are. I think there's some games this weekend, but not SEC games yet. Gotcha. So. Well, that's all that matters, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm glad there's no SEC games this weekend. I am, too. I'm, I, I, I'm looking forward to this weekend. So let's uh, reconvene next week, and we can we can talk about what our doves were eating. Everybody do a dove necropsy? Yeah, we That'd might. Can, cool. We might can drop in on Todd Amonrood and find out what's coming up in the fall issue, because it'll be mailing next week. Oh, good. I'm excited about that. What else? And probably some more food plot stuff because it's uh, it's it's 
that it's time, that time of year. Yeah, I it's, mean, they're, they're in in the north. People are planting, obviously, in Tennessee. And then, you know, this weekend is going to – I mean, we're going to see more tractors going up and down the highway in the next two weeks than mm. we do any other time of the year. So it is time to get that seed in the ground. That's right. Jason, you got anything for us before we get out of here? <laughs> All right. Well, look, folks, uh, we sure appreciate you listening. Be sure and go uh, – uh, this have a chat there's actually an email blast that went out tuesday about brassica so if you're listening to this you can go to our website and mm-hmm. sign up for an email blast and you'll get this every tuesday there's something goes out about yes yeah, the field it. notes newsletter you can go check that out that's really really good and then uh dudley it's about time we're about to start uh, my understanding trees are about to start selling so that the native nursery website's about to get loaded up with trees yeah, yeah it's we've, happening. we've got a few on there now uh, orders are trickling in. What's that web address? www.nativenurseries.com. Here and we go. Native does not have an E on the end of it. All that, right. how we do that it. was a marketing strategy. That's how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a typo. That is not a typo. Yeah. We all love cultipackers. We have talked about them for forever. They're every. Every time we recommend somebody plant a food plot, we mention the word cultipacker, and Packer Max is a great one. Well, it's, I know Dudley has put this one through the test. Yeah, it's the way to go. Um, if, if you've got a four-wheeler, you need a Packer Max. How long have you had yours? I bought mine when I was a new employee at Mossy Oak, I think in 2008 or nine at a trade show. So you've and had it 10, 11 years. And, and I'm and still using it. That's pretty awesome. Mm, yeah, it is. So it's PackerMax.com and Packer uh, Max has two X's, <laughs> so you just Google Packer Max, you'll find it. Lincoln Roan is a great guy, and it's a it's a fantastic product. So, all right, well, we enjoyed it. We're glad to have y'all, and uh, if if uh, good Lord willing, we'll be back next week. So, Lanny, why don't you give them your signature? Get us out of here, Cleve. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.